educate myself and educate myself so I could help to better educate him and help him lead his best life. I think for me, it started out as, um, you know, safety issues because you're as parents are so concerned about how vulnerable our um, children can be. And it's really involved into just supporting him to lead the best life he can and about his human dignity for him to, you know, to understand his body, to understand his health, to understand his relationships and to speak up for himself. Um, and uh, as far as this curriculum, these curriculums were developed by uh, Catherine McLaughlin from Elevatus Training. And she is an educator herself in the world of disabilities. And she really saw a need for developing curriculums um, in the area of sexuality education so she started out developing, you know, developing her curriculum and then started a collaboration actually with Green Mountain um, self-advocates in, in Vermont. And the self-advocates said to her, we, we really want to participate in creating this curriculum as well. And not only in the creation, but in teaching it uh, to, other, to other individuals who need it. And so we have a lot of team, uh, team teaching uh, going on, you know, across the country with, um, you know, with self-advocates along with professionals, which is, um, which is really, really exciting to, to see. And it's exciting to see, you know, information, you know, available now and really, you know, the support that we're that we're finding out there that in the past was so, so difficult to um, to find. Um, I'm just going to make this. Oops, that doesn't. OK. Um, I, so um, really talking. Oh, oh, before we begin, Beth, hold on yeah. one second. OK, let me get this out. Move this. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tati. Yeah, of course. Sorry, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to uh, firstly begin um, with some housekeeping notes, just letting you guys know that this um, presentation is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube page soon. Um, I also wanted to introduce myself. My name is Tatiana Calderon, and I'm the Autism Initiative uh, Coordinator here at Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center. I just want to say a few words about Synergia. Uh, Synergia is a multi-service agency located in Manhattan that has been supporting New Yorkers with disabilities and their families for more than 40 years. We offer a rich source of information and training tailored for parents, including um, parents whose primary language is not English or who they themselves have special training needs. Um, we help them participate more effectively in their children's education and development. And we partner with professionals and policymakers to improve outcomes for all children with disabilities. Synergia is Spanish for Synergy, um, is one of New York City's three federally funded parent centers committed to serving people with disabilities and their families and added with an added focus on communities of color and the economically disadvantaged. Um, Synergia creates, an innovative pro creates innovative programs ranging from transitional housing um, for homeless families who have children with disabilities, community residences for adults with developmental disabilities, parenting classes for adult, um, parents with intellectual disabilities and parenting and education advocacy training for parents with children with disabilities. I want to uh, thank Beth from Elevatus for being here. We're absolutely happy that you can be here with us today and welcome to Synergia. Um, and also before we get started, I did want to share a little bit um, of information about our presenter today. So Beth Sola and A have been, has 25 years of extensive experience working with individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities as a bilingual special educator, um, working with individuals from infancy to adulthood um, and their families, and currently as a self-direction broker to create inclusive, inclusive opportunities for, and support for self-determined individuals to live their best lives. As a parent of, young, of a young adult on the autism spectrum, she also understands the importance of partnering with her parents to start the conversation about healthy, healthy relationships and sexuality education from an early age. Beth is on the advisory board and leads parent workshops in collaboration with Elevate Training. Thank you so much, Beth, for being here today. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. Um, yeah, so here we go. We'll jump, we'll jump right in. Um, so when we talk about um, sexuality, right, we often 
focus on the first three letters. We focus on sex. We focus on, you know, and we it often creates a very strong reaction. You know, we think of intercourse, we think of intimacy, we think of sex. Um, and it can create, you know, it's difficult, difficult or embarrassing to talk about it. Um, creates, a, you know, an uncomfortable feeling for many people to talk about it. And, you know, who can we talk to and who do we feel trust in talking and, and, and asking questions and finding answers? Uh, but in reality, sexuality means much more than intercourse or sex. It means um, intimacy, connection, and belonging, uh, not feeling lonely, right? Having friendships and having all kinds of re relationships. Relationships comes, come in all sizes and shapes and forms and from, from a friendship right down to certainly a romantic or a much more intimate relationship. Uh, it also includes the people, you know, the people that we might be going to school with, the people that we're, that we're working with as well and are in our casual friendships and as well as our family. Um, it's also about how we feel about being the gender we are and our sexual orientation. It's about how we feel about others and how we feel about ourselves and how we make those connections, right? It's about sexual behavior and um, an expression. And it's really, uh, you know, who we are, what we believe, how we feel and, and how we respond. And it goes, our sexuality is, starts at the time where we are born and it goes right through the, you know, through the end of our life. It's the, it's the, the total length of our lifespan and our experiences certainly will change as we, you know, as we age, as we move through our lifespan and we have, we have different experiences, different needs, um, but everyone will, you know, experience you know, we experience life, we experience our sexuality, um, and we are all sexual beings. Uh, it's about our body, it's about our health, and it's about our relationships. Um, so what do, um, you know, self-advocates say, um, individuals with disabilities, self-advocates, um, what do they say that they have wanted to learn about sexuality? Um, they wanted to learn about sexuality so they can learn to have healthy relationships. Uh, regardless, be it a friendship, be it in, you know, co-workers, be it, uh, you know, with family members, be it with someone that you're, you know, partnership that's a deeper relationship. They don't wanna be lonely. And we are social beings, everyone. Disability is, you know, does not get in the way in that or prevent or prevent that. We are all social beings and, and we feel loneliness. And I think, you know, certainly if we've said it once, we've said it, you know, a hundred times through COVID, how it really struck us, how um, in, in the isolation that we experienced, how lonely, you know, so many of us felt and how difficult it is. Um, Self-advocates also say they want to make informed choices. And if they make informed choices with, you know, and maybe they may, may need supported decision-making in that, but make, make informed choices so they, the choices are better, so they're healthier, uh, so they're happier. Um, they want to pick the right person to be in a relationship with. And uh, that's always not easy. And we need, you know, they need support and we need information in, in doing that. And I think that's, you know, probably true for, for almost all people. Um, they want help for the toughest part of a relationship, making it last. Um, you, you know, a relationship is more than just the honeymoon period at the beginning. It's the, it's the ups, the downs, the, you know, the ins and the outs, the, the supports that we, that we, that everyone needs through a relationship. And they would like that as well. And it's not easy to, you know, to, to navigate through that, I think for, you know, for anyone, um, it's, that can always be a challenge. Uh, they wanna be safe and who doesn't wanna be safe? We all wanna be safe. We want, and we want our children who certainly can be much more vulnerable to be safe as well. Um, because we all have desires and needs and that's okay. And I think, you know, oftentimes those of us, with, uh, we have children with, you know, with disabilities, we also, you know, we overlook their sexuality, we overlook their desire um, to be in, a, to, be in to have relationships, um, regardless of what type of relationship it, it is, either because um, oftentimes I'll, you know, <clears throat> hear parents say, well, they never talked about it. So I don't think that they're interested. Um, so, you know, people might have difficulty um articulating that um but once again we are all social beings and <clears throat> excuse me in some way or another um 
so people know what their rights are, right? To, to just to, to be a self-advocate, to speak up and, and have a voice and to, to hear your, and to have your voice heard as well. Um, you know, once they, once again, nothing about us without us, uh, let us participate in decisions about our bodies, about our health, about our relationships. Uh, so we can be self-advocates and not, so we can be sexual self-advocates and not just self-advocates. Um, and uh, really, you know, I think oftentimes we, you know, we want our children to be advocates. We want them to stand up for themselves, to, ex you know, to express themselves what they want. And, you know, if our, cho if our children were to say, I want to get a, I want to have a job or, or I want to move out independently where, you know, we're, we're right there behind them. Right. And to figure out how do we make this work and we're excited about it. And when our children often ask, you know, they bring up um, the topic about they want to be in a relationship. They want to, you know, how do we make more friends? How do we have a relationship, perhaps more intimate, more romantic relationship? It's very easy for us to close the doors right there or really have a tough time with that one. And it's not the same, oftentimes not the same response, right? Is yeah, that's really great to get a job. Let's go out there and get you a job. Let's figure what we need to do for you to live independently. That's what we want. And, um, but they wanna be sexual self advocates as well. And once again, it's for them to know and understand their body, to understand their health and their health needs and their relationships. Um, so as far as self-advocacy, what does it mean? It means speaking up for yourself self-sexually, for, for your body, for your health, for your relationships, regardless of what type of relationship it is, getting information, because as, you know, once again, research always shows the better educated a person is, the better decisions they are likely to make um, and to take a stand. To, to have an opinion and to have your, to be able to express your opinion and to have your voice heard. Um, and to saying to whomever, this, this is my choice. This is what I would like in my life. Um, to stating what your sexual limits are and desires with your partner and respecting limit, others' limits and others' desires. Uh, so, so important. What are, what are the boundaries? Um, regardless of what type of relationship it is, you know, what are the, what are the boundaries that an individual, you know, an individual has and understanding, being able to state what your boundaries are, right? What your limits are. Um, and also learning how to respect the limits and the boundaries of other people as well, which is just as important. And, uh, you know, starting to do what you want to do with relationships and, and being able to have an environment where you feel um, safe and where there is trust to, to talk about those relationships and to find out, you know, what's, what's working, what's not working, how it can be a healthy relationship. And once again, I think that we can all, um, you know, understand that for everyone that's important. You know, for ourselves and, and for our children and, and those with disabilities as well. So today, um, really the, um, for our talk, talking about sexuality and healthy boundaries, the learning objectives are to talk about the benefits of providing sexuality education, um, examine activities to teach healthy boundaries, what are the different types of relationships, understanding those relationships, public versus private, um, you know, behavior and language and conversations, which is extremely important, uh, friendships, uh, and all type of relationships, right? What are the different types of relationships as it says at the top? Um, how to move from a friend to becoming a, a partner with someone, um, body language, um, which is so difficult. And I would say language in general and um, verbal language and body language is um, so difficult often, particularly for, you know, for those on the autism spectrum, which is, a so, it's, you know, social and communication challenges, understanding all of the nuances um, of, of, of language and is very, very difficult and takes a lot of practice. And um, so that's really, really important. 
understanding consent and sexual abuse, um, which is a whole nother <laughs> topic in itself. But one, once again, understanding um, your, you know, being able to state your own boundaries and have them as, um, respected and understanding the boundaries and the wishes and the di desires of another person and respecting that. Uh, and once again, speaking up, speaking up to for what you want, what your boundaries are, and uh, what you don't want, and being able to to have people that support you who um, provide a safe, you know, environment to talk about your concerns, a safe environment where you can go, where you know someone can go and and talk about concerns that they have or something has happened. It's really important. Okay. Um, and I would say with, you know, with self-advocacy, often we will find, I think with individuals with developmental disabilities that so many times decisions are made for them by, um, you know, by, by people who love them, their caregivers, right? Because we're, we do it in the best interest of them and we make decisions for, you know, for our loved ones uh, without really having them participate um, in the decision making. And there's, you know, something that's called learned compliance that we, you know, you will, you'll do as I have as the decision has been made, um, because this is what's best for you. And that really, you know, it's not um, always encouraging them to speak up and, and really listening to them and, and, you know, to an individual and into what they into what they know. And it's really important to, you know, to, um, to allow that, to give them that, the opportunity to let them, to let an individual, to let a loved one have, have their voice and have it heard and respected. Uh, we do have just a kind of a, just a quick thing in the chat. And if I, you can help me Tatiana, if something I can, you know, shows up in the chat, if anyone wanted to put in, uh, just as kind of at the beginning, what are some of the primary messages that you might have received about sexuality when growing up? And um, only because the messages that we have received, our experiences as, as adults, really um, is a window into how difficult or uncomfortable or how much ease we have talking about sexuality with our loved ones. Yeah, and if anyone's willing to um, write it in the chat, I'll gladly read it out to Beth. Yeah. Um, but while you guys go ahead and type, I can definitely start with, I can answer the question. Sure, um, please. So, I mean, primary message um, growing up about sexuality that I received, it was very, as a Latina, um, for us, it was very hush-hush. Yeah. It was, we don't really talk about this, and it's kind of something you end up learning on your own. At least that was my own personal experience. Absolutely. And I think that's probably very common. I think it's very, 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 very common. And, you know, you'll see in, in from one family to another, from one culture to another, how, you know, how much affection you might show, right? In, 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 in your home or in public. Um, but I think talking about it is, it's really just, it's, it's a hush. It's a hush. We don't talk about it. And once again, because it's a, you know, it's, it's difficult. Um, it's, it's, you, we don't know how much information to give, or if we give information to our children, if we are then giving them, you know, all of a sudden permission to do things that, that, that we don't feel that they should be doing. Um, and yeah, it's really, it's really tough. And oftentimes a lot of positive messages um, don't come through. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it's, it's a tough one and, and kind of breaking. I think what's, what is important is that, you know, as, as, as we all think about the messages that we, that we received growing up, uh, you know, just reflect on how that impacts our comfort level, right, to, to talk about it now with our children and particularly those with developmental disabilities. And um, I think an important point you said right there, Tatiana, was that, um, you know, if we don't get, um, and research is shown, if we, the, the places that, that, that we receive information from is, you know, about sexuality is either from our parents, right, or from social media, from TV. And if we're not getting it from our parents and we are getting it from television or social media, what are the messages that are being received? Right. And are those really the messages that we want our loved ones to have? And, 
you know, I've, I've personally found talking with so many, you know, in just conversations with parents that so many of our children, uh, you know, movies and television are, you know, they kind of what we live and die for, right? That's why we're constantly watching movies, constantly watching television. And for those of our children who just love doing that and are so skilled at picking up the, the lines from movies and the behavior from movies, because that's what they're seeing and they think that that's the way things are. Um, there's a big difference between entertainment and between real life. And um, so that's really, you know, it's really why it is so important for parents to, um, you know, to start to build up their their comfort level. And the more that we talk about it, the, the more normal it becomes. And it's not about one conversation for a hundred minutes. It might be about a hundred conversations for one minute, you know, over and over and over again. So it's little by little and watching when our children are watching or young adults, when they're watching television, when they're watching movies, you know, just talk with them casually afterwards. You know, what did you think about it? How about this behavior? Is that entertainment or is that real life? And what is real life? And um, and and understanding the difference. Um, so especially when there's on, on on shows and whatnot where there's soundtracks where they're doing you know where they they've got the soundtracks and going and, and or the laugh tracks right and uh, they're laughing at be at things that, you know, crazy behaviors or whatever, and everybody thinks it's funny, but, you know, often most, many people understand time and place, this is entertainment, I see it, I laugh at it, but I don't repeat it. Um, other people really, that's a gray area for so many people and a real big challenge. So it's, um, you know, take part and, and see what, our, what your children are watching as well. That opens up a conversation to, to talk about all of those things. I don't know if anything came up in the chat at all that you wanted to share, Tatiana, or just... No, that's yeah. all right. And don't feel forced to share anything in the Not chat. Not at all. I think it's really, you know, it's more important to, uh, you know, it's just to acknowledge if anyone had, I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure, but, you know, to, to reflect, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. a really important, it's a really important reflection point. Um, so as far as... Um, you know, I think, um, you know, setting healthy boundaries, I, um, is that, um, I think, which is a huge part of our relationships. And I think that's something that, you know, if individuals with, with disabilities who might have a diff more difficult time communicating and articulating and understanding well and speaking up, um, I think, you know, setting boundaries, we can all, everyone can probably identify that that's, you know, that's an ongoing, um, that's an ongoing skill that we have to develop is setting boundaries for ourselves. Um, and it really understanding what are the guidelines for healthy boundaries and, and understanding how to, to speak up for what you want, what you don't want. Um, and then once again, understanding the boundaries that other people are setting and understanding when you're crossing that boundary as well, um, which is often, you know, which can be so, um, so, so difficult. Um, and once again, it's boundaries with our friends, boundaries with um, family, boundaries with our coworkers, and, um, you know, boundaries with, you know, just all across all the boundaries with the, with the, when we go into the stores around us, right, with our, with all of the people in, in our community. And so boundaries are, um, boundaries, um, calling on, uh, calling someone on the phone, right? Um, how many times a day should you call someone on the phone or text someone? People don't call so much <laughs> anymore, but texting. Um, what time of the day should you text someone? Should you be texting someone at 4 a.m.? Should you be texting someone 50 times a day if they're not, you know, and they're not answering? Um, and then if they don't answer, do you keep texting them more to try and get an answer from them? Or, you know, do you, do you set a boundary that it's okay to, you can text me um, between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m.? Mm -hmm. um, I know someone, someone I was talking with the other day said, 
you know, my friend is, you know, my friend is texting me, but, you know, he texts me in the morning and he texts me in the evening and all he texts is, you know, good morning, good evening, but I wish he didn't text good evening at 11 o'clock at night. I wish he, you know, texted it in, you know, by nine o'clock because I don't want to have any texts after that. And I, uh, you know, I wish he would at least have a little bit of a conversation and say, hey, how are you, right? So, you know, just learning, those little, this, this one person that was texting was just texting twice a day, right? But uh, the, you know, the friend on the other end was, you know, like, I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit of a conversation. It would be nice to have a little bit of a conversation as well. Um, so it's, you know, all about understanding boundaries, how to have conversations and, and, um, and understanding what they are and then and expressing them to, you know, to whoever who you are involved with. Um, so what are the types of, of relationships? Um, you know, understanding what the difference is important for our loved ones to understand the different types of relationships and how do you relate to each other, to each type of relationship? Um, what is the type of touch that you would have within a given type of relationship? And what kind of information do you share? Um, when do you share it? Where do you share it? Um, so those are, you know, all really, really important um, aspects to to start to to think about um you know time and place once again if we could have a very close relationship with someone um a very you know a trusted family member very very trusted friend um but do we talk about private things in public with them right? so um you know once again time and place and with whom so what is, you know, what is a relationship as we're working with our loved ones and helping them, you know, understand how they are processing this information and how they are understanding relationship. It's relationship is typically between two people, right? They sometimes talk to one another and they interact. Um, we talk, we talk and um, interact differently depending upon the relationship. Um, we're not going to probably interact or um, talk with someone that's on our, you know, um, in our uh, French club, right? Right, the way that we would be talking to uh, a parent or a family member or someone, or, you know, a best friend, um, or the person that you, uh, the person at the pizzas, the at the pizza restaurant down the street. We're not going to talk to them the same way. Um, uh, or a teacher, our classmates. Um, and then to really work with our, you know, with, with your loved ones, right? And to, to um, ask them, you know, name someone you know, and what kind of a relationship is it? Uh, to really to see how they're, you know, they're processing it. Um, it could be, um, you know, a close friend in a family. Right, it could be a casual friend, acquaintances, someone from a you know a group that you belong to, a uh, you know an athletic group, a uh, social group, a bowling group. Um, it could be uh, you know a, a class that you attend, uh, so a school group, a college group. Uh, it could be helping professionals, which are people that we don't perhaps don't know, but we identify them through um, either through a uniform that they're wearing um, or, you know, teachers, uh, doctors, right? Um, strangers, people that we don't know. Um, and those that we are, you know, have a romantic, a sexual relationship with. And I'll also put in here once again, you know, coworkers. Um, you know, thankfully, so many of our, our, you know, our loved ones are now really, you know, being embraced and getting jobs out there so much more than they were in the past. And so how do we, you know, what are the relationships we have when we're working and how do we, how do we interact um, with those that we were working and um, actually Elevate's training developed a uh, curriculum specifically for, for the work, uh, workplace with a, um, something called Project Search, which is an, you know, an inclusionary um, employment um, training. Because, you know, people are coming back saying, you know, we need to give education for, you know, how to interact socially um, and boundaries within, within the workplace. Uh, so that's really important as, as well. Um, so I think 
um, what's really nice is with with um, is to use visuals because everybody has everyone has a different learning style, but we're you know we're often you know visual learners, um, and to really you know work with photographs, work with photographs of um, you know uh, people that are known to your to your loved one that are familiar, so they can identify it, um, or they can identify what type of relationships they're seeing there, or if it's not from particularly people that they know, um, just kind of having them look at pictures and say what do you feel this is with this relationship what kind of relationship that this is and it's not always about getting it right that's uh, it's more about understanding how they're processing and what they're seeing and how how are they identifying what um, because of what they're seeing what type of relationship it is for example, if this is, you know, close family and friends, if they were to say, well, I think, that, you know, they're close family and friends. Well, you know, why do you think that um, they're sitting close together? Right. Everybody's happy. Um, they seem, you know, they trust each other um, when you're in a close trusting relationship. You're happy. You're closer together. Um, they look alike. They similar. They might be family members. Um, so that's 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 what I think that might be but really understanding kind of the why behind they think they're family or friends. And that always is a really great springboard to, to understand how someone is processing information. Um, you know, casually, casual friends, family, and, and groups. We have family members that we might just see once a year or twice a year or every couple of years. And we don't have the same relationship as we do if we have, uh, you know, with our brothers or our sisters, let's say, if um, or if you have a cousin next door that you're, you know, you're constantly, um, you know, doing stuff with and having meetups and dinners and, and sharing all the holidays. It could be a different type of, of a, of a family relationship, but you know, casual friends. These are people who um, they're happy together, right? They're smiling. Um, they're they're close. To, they're close together, but they're not embracing each other as they were in the in the previous um, picture. So they're they're close, um, but um, not the same as a family or a very close relationship. Um, helping professionals. Uh, we often identify them once again by by their uniforms, be they, uh, you know, police, um, be they are police, firemen, um, doctors, and, you know, especially um, with, you know, when we go to doctors, that's, um, you know, talking with our, um, you know, with our, with our children, with our young adults beforehand, because they're, they're, you know, if you do need to have, if you're a woman and you don't do need to have to go to the, you know, to a gynecologist for an, for an exam, this is what's going to be happen. This is why it's, this is why they are doing it. You know, what's your comfort level with this and understanding that. Um, also, there are, um, you know, there's a, um, story of a young man who um, was actually got lost in, you know, he did, he got lost in the woods and they had to put out a search team for him. And it was with, you know, it was with professionals. It was with the fire department and they had to go into the, into the woods and they were calling his name and he was taught not to answer to strangers. And so he, when they were calling out his name, he wasn't answering and they, um, you know, had a hard time finding him. They did, thankfully they did find him. Um, but once, you know, once again, those are really gray areas that are important to, to talk about and, um, you know, to support our, you know, our, our children and our loved ones. Um, and uh, strangers. Uh, right? How do you behave when you're, you know, you're on a bus here or on a subway or, um, you know, in a large venue where you're surrounded by people that you that you don't know? And, um, you know, once again, um, you know, I think it's just as important as to, you know, identify who are strangers and how we interact with them, but also to really work on helping our um, loved ones understand what's strange behavior. Because oftentimes um, we know that when abuse does occur, it often occurs by someone that you that is known to that individual. So, you know, what does strange behavior um, look like? 
right? Even from someone that you know, if you're told to keep secrets or don't talk about this, or, you know, don't, um, they're talking about private things that really shouldn't be talked about. So just as important as understanding strangers, right, is understanding what strange behavior is um, from certainly those around us and as well what could be strange behavior on behalf of, uh, you know, of our loved ones. Um, and a quick example of that was, you know, a young, a young uh, an individual who was living um, independently and, you know, was able to be home alone and heard some in an apartment complex and heard some, you know, some commotion outside. And since this person was home alone, didn't, you know, wanted to kind of see what was happening outside, but really didn't want people to know he was, he was at home let's say. So he, you know, opened up the blind to peek out and to see what was happening. And they're just, as he was peeking out, there's an apartment just across the way. And so this person is looking out to see in the apartment to see what's happening, what's this commotion happening outside, but I really don't want anybody to know I'm, I'm home right now. And the people across the way, what they're perceiving is there's someone who is just cracking open their blinds and staring out that's strange, right? So, um, you know, it's so many ways to interpret behavior. And um, so it's really, you know, and sometimes, you know, behaviors come along that we would never um, anticipate or never anticipate that they could be perceived by someone else in, in a, as in a strained way or a threatening way or uncomfortable way. And so always, you know, once again, talking, talking through it and understanding it. Um, and once again, you know, a, a romantic relationship, uh, uh, how, you know, how is it? They're close together. He's giving her a kiss, right? And on the cheek and, you know, once again, talking about what's, um, you know, how do we, how do we express ourselves, um, you know, affectionately with, with our partners, both in, in public and, and, and private. So once again, just to kind of summarize that up, like, you know, to talk with our loved ones and that's an ongoing, you know, conversation with just in their general life um, within what they're seeing in movies, on TV shows, on, you know, social media. Um, it's just, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, once again, who are, who are um, close family members and friends uh, around you? Who are your casual friends and, and what groups do you belong? do you belong to and how are your relationships within that group and you know who are the helping professionals that that are um that are uh working supporting you or who are out there in the community if we do need help and what do they look like uh and who are strangers and how do we behave around strangers and do you you know just uh, do you stare at a stranger or if you make an eye contact with someone and, you know, say, here, I'll, I'll hold the door open for you and you let the stranger, you know, go through, you're being very polite and, and then you continue on. Um, and so, and romantic sexual um, relationships as well. What are the, you know, what are the boundaries? What are understanding having, you know, your self heard and understanding and hearing what the other person in the relationship is, is saying. Um, here's just a couple, I have a couple of short videos here, just, um, you know, kind of examples to show, uh, and these are, are, are available on Elevators Training. You can go into the, um, resource, uh, section on our, on our page and they will have it. And let me see if I can do this. Um, but once again, we're, you know, we're all we're visual learners. We're all usually very strong being visual learners and, and to see things and not only, and to see a video that would be an example of how um, people greet each other in different types of relationship, but also role-playing and practicing it is, um, is an excellent way too. So I'm going to see if I can um, do this. Get this down, all right. So if people are, you know, this is obviously in, in a workplace. Um, it was, you know, very, uh, very quick, right? Um, and very, uh, they just kind of acknowledge each other, 
and they moved and they moved on. They're, you know, they're, they're, in the, they're workers in the, same, in the same place or, you know, if they were in a community and they said hello and they're opening the door, um, but they continue on and they're really not engaging in, in conversation. Um, another one here. Okay. So once again, there was, um, you know, in this in this scenario here, they are co-workers. Um, it appears to be there. It appears they could be co-workers. It looks like an office setting. Um, and, uh, you know, they're certainly much more acquaintances. They're talking. They, they have a short conversation with each other. Uh, you know, the one woman did put her her hand on the shoulder of the other woman briefly and um, they had a short exchange. And then and kind of moved on. And then um, you know, another type of uh relationship. Oh, great. It's so nice to see you. You too, you too. I've been trying to call you and I haven't been able to. Yeah, it's been pretty busy. Yeah. Hi. 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 Let's see. Let's make a let's make a call. Let's see. 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 Let's so those are, um, let me see how I yep, close that out. So um, yeah, you know, different, once again, kind of as a, as a visual, right? To, to see some, to see how people are actually engaging just rather than talking about it. And, you know, also kind of some role, role playing within that, let's practice that. Um, you know, who do you just, who will you give a hug to, right? When you, when you see them. Um, and once again, that's just also can be very, very cultural. I know there are, you know, certainly many cultures where you, you go up and you, you, you meet someone, you give them a big hug or you give them a kiss on either cheek. And there are other cultures where it's just, you know, it's hands off, it's hands off. So, um, it's always, a you know, a really, um, really, um, it's a good conversation. I knew of a, you know, another uh, a young man who uh, was introduced to a family friend out in, you know, like in a pub, in, in a store, in a big store, and um, this person went up to, you know, extend their hand to, to shake their hand, and you know, this young man took extended his hand as well to shake, and then held on to this woman's hand and gave her gave her a kiss on the hand, which he, you know, thought was very, very kind of suave. And, you know, he's kind of a cool dude. And, um, but the woman was very taken aback. Because, um, you know, that was really kind of invading into her private space something that you wouldn't do when you meet someone for the first time and uh you know so you know the conversation was had later well you know let's you know, understand right boundaries and how you if you're meeting someone for the first time extend your hand to shake their hand and um yeah where else have you you know have you seen that and he's you know like well you know james bond did it or i saw it on this show or that show and you know once again we get back to learning what what is the these social skills that are being learned uh through movies or you know tv and um how they are taken from that context and put into another context where it's not appropriate and uh you know really and and having that conversation just for as a as a it's a learning opportunity it's a teachable moment uh which is really um really important and those teachable moments come along often very frequently. <laughs> um, oh, once again, then, uh, okay, we went through the greetings. I'm just gonna go right through these, different way to greet. And once again, everyone will be receiving the PowerPoints and the handouts from this, cause it's a lot of information and it's really, I'm, you know, you will have that just then afterwards sit home and kind of go through things, right? And, and digest it and think about it and, and, and reflect, um, you know, over a long period of time. Um, but really understanding what, you know, what the um, different ways to greet, right? If it's um, for, um, for strangers, if on the first one with strangers, you're kind of keeping a distance, right? It's only brief um, eye contact. There's no conversation. 
Um, the second one, they're walking toward each other, smiling. There's um, a longer, um, there was a no physical touch. They did put a, a hand on their shoulder um, and that one we actually did see, but there was a bit longer inter, um, longer eye contact, right? They did use each other's name. They knew each other. There was a little bit of a small talk and they moved on. And then the other one where they, you know, they knew each other much more, uh, much better. They were smiling when they walked toward each other. They were hugging. They had longer eye contact. And, you know, you would assume that they probably knew each other's, you know, they were friends, they knew each other's family. Um, so a, a very different relationship and, and eye contact is, you know, so can say so much and is so difficult to understand. We have, you know, certainly individuals who don't like to make eye contact, um, period. And then if you don't like to make eye contact, where do you look, right? And, um, and for those who do like to make eye contact, what's the difference between a stare and a, you know, a glance and a stare? It could be a matter of two seconds, two or three seconds, um, which is really very brief, but can be a long time. Um, and so that body language can be misread by someone else. Um, so, um, once again, we, we're kind of moving in from there, from relationships to, um, I think, Tatiana, if you're there, you are, right? If you wanted something that the difference between public and something that's private, um, how would you describe the difference between the two? Because that's, you know, public and private behavior is huge um, in understanding, right? Social, um, our social skills. Something um, public is when we're, you know, we're out in the, um, you know, we're out, we're in a, we're in a classroom talking with all of our friends, right? Um, uh, and what is private behavior? Um, you know, when we're going to the bathroom, the door is closed. When we change our clothes, the door is closed. Um, you know, when we talk about, there are personal things that we talk about within our relationships or even our, you know, our body, what's happening to our health that perhaps would be more private. Um, you know, in the middle of a class for a set, for, let's say, are you, you know, you're going to be talking about how, you know, you have your, um, you have your period right now, and you've got cramps and, and oh, how, how, you know, how uncomfortable you feel, or you just ate the wrong thing last night or this morning, and now you have diarrhea, or is that something that we're going to be talking you know, in the middle of a class with someone or, or is that something that's a little bit more private? We can like, we can talk about that. You know, we can talk about that afterwards. I want to hear about it, but let's talk about it in a little bit more of a private place or, you know, things that are private about your relationship, um, time and place, uh, once again. Um, so public, we really kind of use as a, as a definition um, would be a public is when other people are there or might be there. Um, it's a place where people can go in and go out. Um, There's certain ways of speaking and touch that are okay to do in public, but not all. Okay? And I think that's really, um, you know, key. It's a place where people can go in and can go out. Um, a bathroom in your home is private. Um, but a bathroom in a store or in school is public because people can come in and come out. Um, private is where you're alone and no one can come in and come out. There's certain ways of speaking and touch that are okay to do in private, but not to do in public. Okay. And once again, as we did with the relationships, if you work through and you show um, photographs, those visuals, right? Of is this a private place or is this a public place? And, and how do you know? And if you work through the, you know, those simple definitions of public place is some place where there might not be anybody now, but people can come and go, then it's public, right? If it's private with the door closed, then it, it's a, you know, it's a room, usually your bedroom, right? With the door closed that's private and people are not going to be coming in or coming out. Um, and, you know, showing pictures on the before on the bus, right? This is a public place. 
people are coming and going. You could be sitting all the way in the back where nobody's looking at you, but you're still in a public place, right? There might not be anyone on the bus right now, but at the next stop, other than the driver, right? And yourself and the driver, um, you know, where people are gonna be coming and coming and going from the bus. Um, is this public or private? And how do you know? Once again, it looks like she, you know, she's taking a bath. She's doing that's, you know, a private, um, and she's, you know, she's relaxing in her in her bathtub. And most likely, the, you know, the door is closed, and this is this is private. This is a private place. Um, movie theaters. Um, always a good one. And there could be gray areas in movie, uh, movie, theory, uh, movie theaters. Is this a public or a private place? It's a public place because people can, you know, there's other people there. People can come and go, even if you're the only ones in the theater watching the movie. Um, uh, people could be coming in or could be coming out. Um, you know, there are people that, that employees in a movie theater that will be coming in to, uh, you know, maybe to lead somebody else in and they're coming with a flashlight. They actually, there are people from the movie theaters, they will go in and they'll, they'll check temperatures actually in the room while the movie is going on. People can come and go. Um, and even if you're sitting, you know, you're sitting way back in the back where it's dark and nobody can see you, you're still in a, you're still in a public place. And once again, if an usher comes in with a flashlight, you know, it's, um, and you know, you're, you're in a public place and that's, you know, probably a gray area for, um, you know, for many of the, and those, once again, those gray areas are so difficult for, you know, for, for our loved ones to understand. So simply said, I think that, you know, even if it is dark and you're the only ones in the theater, um, and regardless of what you see in the movies <laughs> and on TV, um, a theater, a cinema is a, it's a, it's, it is a public place. Um, once again, and uh, you know, we see a young woman, you know, laying down, having her drink on a hot summer day, on a nice, beautiful summer day. And is this public or is this private? What do you think? What are your thoughts? And there could be many thoughts. You could say it is a, it's a public place where you can lay out and buy a beach, and you can lay out in your, um, you know, in your bathing suit and take the sun. It could be, is it, a, is it private because it's uh, someone's backyard? Um, if it is a backyard, can other people look in and see you? Um, so there's lots of, you know, there's lots of conversations to, to, be, to be had. And um, another thing is it's, she's in a bathing suit. Um, where do you wear bathing suits, right? Um, there are parks that you can wear bathing suits in that are perhaps by a lake. Um, there are at the beach, you wear a bathing suit, but you're not gonna wear the bathing suit to go do your food shopping. Um, and I, you know, I, it was, I, I got caught in that actually the other day, my, you know, my son was going to the, he was gonna go to the beach and he, um, or we had gone to the beach and he, um, you know, he had on his big, he had a swim trunks, which are kind of like, you know, they're Bermuda shorts and he had a shirt on, we left the beach and he had his shirt on and, and um, uh, I said, you know, let's stop in the store and let's, you know, pick something up and, you know, he says, mom, I can't, you know, I'm in my bathing suit. And my first you know, thought was, um, and I certainly, you know, had changed. I had a dress on, put everything over my bangs, it all covered up so I can go into a, into the supermarket. And, you know, my first thought was, was, well, your bathing suit looks just like shorts anyway, just big long Bermuda shorts. And, you know, it's, that's a, a gray area for him. It's a gray area. So I, you know, he kind of knows the rule. You don't wear bathing suits in, in, when you're going into the store. So I was like, you know, okay, we'll go home and get changed and then we'll go do our, um, you know, do our, do our shopping. Um, so yeah, he, uh, you know, I was uh, pleasantly surprised that he, the lesson that he taught me or what I had to be aware of. Um, so that was, that was always fun. Um, and then, you know, once again, you know, you provide visuals for, you know, to, to look at. And besides the pictures that you saw, what are, you know, can, can you think of other examples of public places, other, you know, public places in your home? Um, I remember I we was having a conversation with one mom and she said, I'm real, I have a really challenge because my, my, you know, young team, teen um, is masturbating in the living room. And um, so she was, you know, cause so she said, but what he has done is he's, he hides under a blanket. So, um, but it's still in the living room. 
And so, you know, the conversation was, well, he's understanding that that is a private behavior because he is completely covering himself up, right? So that others cannot see him, but it's happening within a place in a larger scale within the, within the, within the living room where people are coming in and coming out. And so therefore it's public. And, um, you know, to work around that and not to say you can't do what you're doing, but that is a private behavior. And, you know, thank you. I understand you have your blanket, but let's move it into a private place as well. So there's lots, so many, oftentimes so many layers, right, to, uh, to things that we don't think of. We don't think of them until we, until we experience them. Um, and once again, public um, discussions, what's okay to talk about in public? Um, are you going to talk about, um, you know, what's parts of your of a relationship that um, uh, really are, are private and we don't talk about them in public in a loud voice? Um, do you, if someone were to talk about, have questions about masturbation, is that something we're gonna talk about in public or is that a, private conversation. Yes, I, I want to hear you. I want to answer your questions, but that's a private conversation. That's a private conversation. Let's do it in private. Um, you know, once again, if you're in a class, I'm sure we're on a sexual, if you're in a class on, on particularly sexuality education and they're talking about it, and that's a discussion that is had, is being had between a group of people, um, you know, you are in a learning situation, which is, which is, totally, which is different, right, than just kind of sitting at McDonald's and talking about it. But once again, it's, there's so many nuances to, um, to, to, to this. Um, what happens when we talk about private topics in public? Uh, it makes people uncomfortable. You know, if you're sitting in a, um, a painting class and, you know, someone talks to you and starts saying about, you know, once again, about how oh, crampy they feel, they have their period and, or they just ate something this morning and I've got diarrhea and I've got cramps and I'm gassy and I'm bloated is, you know, makes people feel, makes people feel uncomfortable. So where can we talk about it? Um, and once again, how do, how do we touch each other in public? How do we, um, how do you greet someone? Uh, as we had seen before, different people and um, in different situations. Um, how do you, you know, kiss people, right? You might, you have your partner, maybe when, you know, when you are in public, you, you know, you give them a light kiss on the, on the, on the lips or on the cheek. Um, but, you know, how many times have we been somewhere where in a restaurant or whatever, where, or in a park or wherever it is, and people are, you know, make, are kissing passionately and someone will say, you know, hey, go get a room. And so what they're saying is that's, private. With the level you're at, that's private. Take it somewhere else. It's uncomfortable for everyone around us. And then once again, um, if you're in a romantic relationship with someone in work, is that okay? All right? And how do you behave with someone in, in, you know, with your, with your coworkers? So once again, we go through with the same thing. What are things that are private? What are places that are private? What are body parts that are private? Um, what's okay to talk about in private? And who is it okay to talk about private things with? And um, that can always be difficult too, because you could have someone that you feel very, a lot of trust with, a friend you have a lot of trust with, and you, you know, you you want to talk about something privately with them, and that person is really uncomfortable hearing private things, and you know, could perhaps you know. Um, go to their parent and say, you know, oh, my friend is talking to me about these private things and I really feel uncomfortable about this. So it's so many nuances and it's, you know, these are conversations to talk about public and private, um, you know, you know, little snippets continuously through, through, their, through their life, finding those teachable moments. Um, Touching and privacy. What are some examples of how we can touch our bodies, you know, that are private? Um, you know, when you're washing yourself in the shower, when you're when you're washing yourself, when you are, you know, when you do have um, sexual feelings, what are those sexual feelings? And, you know, how do you handle them and, and where do you handle them? Uh, you know, do you ignore them? Do you acknowledge them and move on? Or do you need to find a private place, right? Um, and uh, what are examples of ways we touch someone else that are private and 
are they consenting? Are they saying yes? Um, and, and are they able to say, you know, once again, are they able to say, give permission or not give permission? And is that permission or denial of permission understood? Um, and what is a place that can be private when we want to touch ourselves or someone else? Um, sometimes we have to speak up and use self-advocacy skills to have a private place at home. I know that, um, you know, from, you know, a, a, in a bedroom is often a, it's a, a bedroom is a, is a private place for, for an individual. And I think that it's, you know, it's, it's important to, um, you know, to respect it, but, you know, if a child has their, their own bedroom and to allow them to, you know, they just might need time alone with their door closed and, and that's okay. Um, because to understand the privacy of others, you also have to be able to own it yourself. Uh, just some handouts, once again, that you will get is that different types of touch, different types of relationships, um, talking about public and private, close friends and families, hugging, right? Casual friends and groups, workplace, a fist bump, you know, a high five, shaking hands, um, coworkers, um, helping professionals. Once again, uh, you know, a fist bump, a high five, shaking hands. Um, it's kind of strange doing that again after, you know, two and a half years, three years of COVID when we were, we were six feet apart and there was no touch whatsoever. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of gotten to be a, it was a funny feeling to, to kind of shake hands again. And sometimes it's, I think still it's, it's, there's a lot of hesitancy with someone, even if you want to, to shake your hands or, uh, you know, I think what we don't have in here is, you know, touching elbows, right? That's we're kind of given a high five with our elbows. Um, but yeah, COVID really, you know, flipped uh, the tables on, on all of this. And helping professionals, once again, kind of, you know, a fist pump, a high five, a shaking hands, or with your elbow, right? Um, people that you don't know, you don't touch them, right? And um, romantic sexual relationships, you need consent, right? And what is the behavior in public? And what is the behavior in private? Um, once again, we're going through, you know, what's it okay to talk about in public? What are, um, you know, what are private, you know, what happens when we talk about private topics in public, it makes other people feel comfortable, make, make feel, feel uncomfortable. Um, so if someone wants to discuss a private topic and you are in public, say, I hear you, I want to hear what you have to, you know, I want to hear what you want to talk about, but let's find a place. Um, where we can talk about it in private and in a private voice, which a private voice is is a lower is a lower tone voice. And with our voice, we can also indicate if something is public or private. Um, and how do how do people touch each other in public? And you know, especially if you're in a romantic relationship, and once about you know what again once again about about kissing, and uh, you know if it gets to the point where someone is going to say, hey, you know, go get a room. Uh, so really under, you know, understanding that and making people feel good about the relationship that they are in and, and expressing their affection um, and how it is expressed in, in different, in different place, time and place, right? And I'm going to kind of go through these because we have, um, you know, those are repetitive. This you will find in the, in the, um, within your handouts, these are just some, um, once again, some role playing that you can kind of go through about practicing public and private conversations, how you feel about each other, what someone might be saying, um, if someone is making you feel someone uncomfortable or not. So I'm gonna kind of scroll through those, um, but you will have them. And then, you know, kind of our relationships start out as friendships. And that's really where, you know, relationships need to begin. I've, you know, oftentimes so many, you know, young individuals, their relationships kind of from, you know, they're all this, they're, they're a friend and they go from zero to a hundred are ready to have, a, ready to get married and have kids within, you know, 24 hours. So it's, you know, taking it, friend, taking it slow. And what is the development of a relationship? Um, what makes someone a friend, right? Why is friendship important to you? Um, and talking about where you can meet people to come become friends with, um, joining a social group that is of interest to you, um, a large one, a small one, depending upon what your, you know, your individual wants is. Um, and then kind of talking with, you know, with our loved ones about, um, 
do you have a story about how you met a friend? Or I know uh, so-and-so is a really good friend. Can you tell me how you met that person, right? And what were the things you did together that uh, really helped um, help that, that, that relationship, that friendship, you know, blossom and that you wanted to do things together um, on other opportunities? Um, and if you wanted to become a friend with a person, how can you let them know? Can you know? Can you say, oh, you know, I'll, 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 there's a meetup. Uh, you know, we're all getting together. You know, at the same place next week. I hope you're here. I enjoy your company. Um, or what are the things that you can do to, you know, once again to um, help a relationship, a friendship, friendship grow. Um, you know, you and what are the common interests that you have? And then how do you move from a friend to a partner and to a sweetheart? And once again, oftentimes it, you know, it can kind of go from zero to a hundred in, in the blink of an eye. And, and how do we, you know, help someone understand, right? Um, uh, how to make a, how to, how to kind of move through that progression. And what happens if someone that you are a friend with you're interested in, uh, but they're not interested in a deeper relationship. They just want to keep it a friendship. How you how you work through that, you know, disappointment on one side, right? And um, perhaps on the other side is someone you're you're a really nice person. I enjoy your company. I just but I just want to be friends and let's do things together because we have a lot of shared interests. Um, and you know, a paid support person. What is your, you know, what is your relationship with the people who support you, and are paid to support you? Um, you know, very different, right? They're often um, looked upon as friends, um, but they are also a professional working with you. And what if someone is under eighteen? Um, you know, that's that's we get into legal issues here, right? If someone is 21 and they have an interest in, you know, someone that's, you know, 16, 17, what are the, um, you know, what are the legal implications of that? And uh, really understanding uh, the importance of age. Um, but then if you flip the coin, um, <clears throat> you know, and you have someone who is 25 interested in someone that's 40, um, or, that's not illegal, right? Um, but to talk about that and talk about perhaps what's, um, you know, what's good about the relationship, what's, what's working and maybe what's not working in the relationship. Um, so there's always, a, you know, certainly a lot, a lot of conversations to go on. Um, you know, when you, this is always a, a tough one too, because it's the nuances of flirting. When you get to know someone and you're, you know, you're you're a friend, and then you start to feel like this could be a really an extra special person, right? How do you how do you let them know that? And um, <clears throat> once again, you know, flirting. And what does flirting mean? And how do you flirt? And if you're flirting, um, you know, how is the other person taking it? You know, if you wink at somebody and they turn away, um, you're making you know you're making them feel uncomfortable. They're really not interested. Or if someone looks back at you and smiles, there you know there's there's an interest there. Um, the since we're we you know we text so often, right? Even with emojis, there can be flirting going on with emojis. Um, you know, with the with the hearts going on, or you know, the Care Bears, or or whatever it is. And you know, one person might be using those emojis just as kind of like a BFF way, right? Or you know, you're a friend. I really care for you. You're sweet, and um, it really is kind of like an affectionate. Your, you know, manner, and the other person could be taking it as flirting. So it's so, uh, you know, all those nuances are so difficult to, um, you know, to work through or to understand. And once again, it's, it's always finding those teachable moments and moving through it, um, you know, in, in, tidbits is along the way. It's many, you know, it's a, it's the hundred, it's the one, 101 minute conversations. It's not a one, 100 minute conversation. Um, and often over and over again. Um, and how do you ask somebody out? 
right? So all the social skills, how do you ask somebody out? When do you ask them, you start out going to a group activity and when do you ask them out just, you know, the, the two of you to go to a movie alone, right? Um, all of those skills that are really important that um, to learn and how to navigate. Um, so your, your desires and wishes are understood, but also the desires and wishes of the other person are understood and respected and how to make, you know, how to make good decisions and how to be supported in your decision making. Um, you know, once again, going through flirting. Um, that's a, you know, tough when they have, you know, where do you look at someone when you're flirting and then eye contact, right? If you're, you know, if you keep your, you know, if you, if you, if your eyes are down at looking someone at someone's body, because you don't want to look at their face, then that could be very uncomfortable for the other person. Um, right? Be it a, you know, be a male or female looking, are you looking at their breasts? Are you looking at their crotch? That's can be very, very um, uncomfortable for the other person without the person who's doing the looking is realizing. Um, so where do you look if you don't want to look at their face? Do you look off to the side, right? Um, so those, all of those innuendos, all of those little different, those little skills are, are um, you know, once again, over and over again, need to be um, kind of chatted about in those little 101 minute conversations. Uh, you know, I think probably many of us through our, you know, through our experience in this, this world with our children with developmental disabilities and understanding, you know, helping them to understand their own emotions and articulate their own emotions. But once again, being able to understand and respect the emotions of other people is um, really, you know, is key and, you know, using visuals look at this person, how do they feel? Um, here we have pictures of, you know, drawings. Um, maybe they can't really relate to, to the drawings of people. Maybe they need to see real photographs of people. Um, maybe they need to sit down, you, you know, role play with another person and you say, okay, I'm gonna make a face. What do you, how do you think I'm feeling? Um, and, um, you know, kind of practice it in and out. Um, but once again, I think even the best of us in our own lives, we, you know, we misread people. People. We miss. We misunderstand other people. We do something that we that we want to be taken in one way, and someone else perceives it in another way. So it's um, it's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. Um, you know, once again, talking on the phone, right? How long do you talk on the phone? What time do you call someone if someone wants to say um, goodbye? Are you respecting that they're that they're saying goodbye and they want to hang up? Um, you know, I, you know, how many times do we, you get to the point where someone blocks somebody else on the phone because uh, they won't stop calling me. They won't stop calling me when I'm working. They won't, when I say goodbye in the morning, they won't hang up or in the evening or during any conversation, they, they don't want to hang up. And, you know, that's unfortunate because you don't want a relationship to end because boundaries aren't being understood. And, you know, our loved ones need a lot of help in understanding once again, the boundaries of others and being able to, to state um, what their own boundaries are and to make sure other people respect their boundaries. Um, talking on the phone, once again, we said going, you know, kind of keep it between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. unless you have permission otherwise. Um, you know, talk about joining groups, what groups we can join in. And these we all, you know, how to, how to ask somebody out on a date. Once again, what do you do? What's the language? Um, who pays for the date? Um, where are you going? What's a, a common interest? Are we? Are you going a place where both of you are interested in going? Having the same type of food? You know, do you both like Italian food? Do you both like sushi? Do you both like Chinese? Um, so you can both enjoy it. Um, and um, here we're kind of getting into, you know, what is not consent um, and, uh, you know, coercion, pressure into things, which is the opposite. And that's once again is a whole lesson in itself, but you will have this. Um, and those are, you know, um, important topics to talk about. And I think that that's also important for, you know, us as parents that, um, you know, and, and to teach the family members around us and those around us not to try to push, you know, our loved ones to do something if they say no to respect that. Um, because, you know, we can also all find ourselves guilty of doing that. Oh, come on, you can do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. But if someone says no, then, un then respect the no. Mm -hmm. 
um, consent. In a you know, in a nutshell, it means um, giving a yes that's freely chosen, right? You're not pushing someone, not forcing them, not intimidating to do that. To do that, and um, I'm just going to move forward because I see it. The time goes by quickly. All kind of examples of consent, but basically, consent means. Um, it's a yes that's free, freely chosen, right? And um, you know, if it's yes and they say no, it's it's not. You know, if it says yes and they mean no, it's not. It's not consent. And you know, if you say no, they're not giving consent. Um, and that starts from something as simple as, um, you know, can I borrow your baseball cap? No. Okay. Something as simple as that is giving them that power, right? To, to moving up into really when we're talking about someone crossing the boundaries with you, someone coming into your private space, someone touching, you know, someone with your with your body, right? With your help, with you, with your health and with your relationship. And here's some slides on sexual assault. Um, once again, you'll all have those, but time isn't really going to, um, you know, allow us to go over that. Once again, private and sexual parts. Um, and here's some scenarios. And I think at the end, just to wrap it up, is once again, teaching those ability to speak up, to be assertive. And um, what does that look like? Standing and sitting up straight, looking at a person, you know, to look them in the eyes, to, um, to use a good, a good voice, a good tone, and um, to be able to feel that you can say what you are feeling or thinking without feeling guilty about it, um, to stick up for what you believe in. And, and you know what, we, we can agree to disagree as well, I think is um, really um, you know, important for all of us to know in our lives. And I'm going to stop sharing this right now. Um, but what I do want to, you know, finish up is it's, it's so much information and, you know, is once again, to try to pack it into, um, it's, 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 a once again, it's a springboard. What's the deficit um, that, that... Hmm? I'm sorry, I heard something. Yeah, it was, it was, I think it was recently he got kicked off for a minute. Oh, okay. So, I, you know, I think that this, you know, once again, today is I know we have some more, some more webinars coming up, but once again, we're, you know, we're starting the conversation and by talking about it, you're here, you're validating, you know, what you, what you want to do. Um, and I hope you get, you got some tips, even if it's one and, um, you know, it's just, it's continuing, it's continuing the conversation, just keep it going. And, and, uh, you know, I recently read from an organization called Sex Positive Families. It's called sexpositive.com um, is their site. Um, but it said, um, I saw this at the end of 2020, you know, 2021. So I'll apply this for 2022 going into 2023. Oh, oh my God, already. But it said, you know, what did you achieve this year? And um, what will you continue to do in 2000? I'll say 2023. But it was, you know, did you, you honestly answered a sexual health question for, that your child asked you. Um, you shared a positive, um, you know, a positive book or a resource about sexuality um, with your child. Uh, you shared a positive, a sex positive resource with a friend or a family member. Um, you did not force your child to give or receive affection from anyone they did not want to be it a family be, you know be it a close family member or you know or a friend right um and i think last you know and just as important and we all forget is did you nurture your own sexual health right we have to take care of ourselves if we're going to take care of those that we love and you know if you just did one of those then you know, you give yourself a pat on the back, right? Give yourself a pat on the back. And we're all, yeah, we're doing the best we can. And it's a journey we're all in together, so. Again, thank you so much, Beth, for such a wonderful presentation. We do have a few minutes for a q and A. If anyone would like to write their questions down in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, Beth, I am gonna read to you some questions we did receive during the registration. Okay. Um, so one parent had wrote um, how, how to get along and exhibit appropriate behavior was one of the questions that they had asked. How to, um, I think that first of all, it's, you know, modeling it 
for our children. Um, I think, you know, I'll go back again to since so there's such strong influences from social media, television and movies where, you know, we, we're kind of up against it. We got a lot to be up against. Right. And um, but I think modeling it and having those short conversations um, and, you know, just building the um, building the trust that your children can come and talk to you and norm normalizing the conversation, even if it's it's tidbit by tidbit. It's wonderful. And someone else wrote, how do you keep peace among siblings? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. <laughs> the million, um, the million dollar question. I, you know, um, I think listening, you know, listening, right? Oftentimes it's listening more than you speak, right? Listening, you know, we have two ears and one mouth, really listening to what both of our children, you know, uh, both of our children, um, you know, all of our children are saying and understanding that um, and how we, and also how, once again, how modeling, how we talk to our kids. There was a book way back in the day, I don't even think it's published anymore, but it was um, how to talk so your kids, how to talk so your kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk. It was my Bible way back in the day. And um, it's, you know, it's about, how I hear you, how can we solve this, right? And I think the last one we had for a registration question was, how to explain the boundaries on social skills? You know, it's, it's, um, I, you know, I think as we saw right now that the, the boundaries are, there's endless boundaries that need to be set in all of our lives. And I think you have to take it, you know, really um, situation by situation, item by item, and really be, um, open and focused on those teachable moments and the um, to take advantage of them and those you know 101 minute talks over and over again um, and and then also creating as what I always like to call the circle of support that is around someone that have the same messages being given by everyone um, around that person so that they're receiving the same messages yeah um, no one else wrote in the Q&A, so I think we'll just go ahead and um, talk about the surveys in the polls. Stacey, if you want to jump in. Hi, everybody. Yes, uh, just feel free to go ahead and take our poll. Uh, it's a really quick poll. It's nine questions and or 10 questions rather. Um, but yes, please take that. We'll also be sharing links to a separate poll for Elevatus so you they can uh, have feedback from you. Um, and I will put those in the chat now. And if you don't access them, I will send them via email in our follow-up email that we'll be sure to share with you. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. And if you have any questions, we're happy to stay on and uh, address them. I also want to tell you that we will be having Beth uh, and Elevatus uh, for a series. This is a three-part series that we're working together on. Um, and yes, and I believe the next one is Consent understanding consent and all of what that entails. Um, consent can be a complex concept. It can be an abstract concept as well. Um, so how do we address consent with our children so that they are consenting adults and have a better understanding? Uh, and then the next one will be about supporting self-advocates. So how do we support our young youth with disabilities so that they can speak up for themselves and also articulate what they want and what they need in terms of sexuality and sexual education. So we'll definitely be uh, um, we're excited to have those presentations and I believe Beth will be with us as well. So we're excited to have Beth back, but uh, yes, please be sure to sign up. And uh, we'll see you in October. Thank Tati, you. back to you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So uh, as JC said, if you could just kindly take the polls and he'll also be sending Elevatus's surveys. Um, if you guys have any questions, we will be here. Um, again, I do want to state that if you do need support or additional resources, you can always call our intake line at 212-643-2840 Monday through Friday from 9 to 4 or email us at intake at synergianny.org. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating today. And thank you, Beth, for such a wonderful presentation. And we look forward to working with you again for the next thank second part of our series. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, JC. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Synergia. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Enjoy the rest of the summer. Bye bye.